here today. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. And I suppose, yeah, I want to pick up where, where David um, kind of left off in, in, in his presentation, um, thinking about how we can begin to use algorithms and machine vision to support our interpretation of, of tissue samples. Um, I want to give you some of the experiences that we've had, um, primarily in research and discovery, about how that may translate out into, into clinical practice. Um, as Margaret says, I, I, I have a chair in pathology, bioimaging, and, and informatics at Queen's. I'm also the, the founder and vice president for research and development in a company called Path Excel, um, uh, another Northern Ireland based company that specializes in <coughs> digital pathology software. So not about scanning the slides, not about the hardware, but about the software to make those slides um, uh, useful and valuable across a range of applications um, in education and, and, and research. And you'll see some examples as I talk about, uh, about how we've interacted and worked with Path Excel to deliver these types of solutions. There are other competitive uh, offers out there, they're just not as good as ours. <laughs> um, so yeah, as we've already heard today, um, we're seeing a massive growth in, in digital pathology um, and there are a range of market reports that are available out there that kind of give predictions as to how this, this market is going to grow, estimating that it's going to be worth 437 million by 2018. Other reports indicating that together with, uh, with molecular diagnostics and, um, and precision medicine that it could reach as much as 5.7 billion US dollars by, by 2020. Um, and while you may take some of these reports with a pinch of salt, there's no question that digital pathology as an area of technology and as an area of application is, is growing significantly across a range of, of, uh, of areas. Um, but it's not new. Um, digital pathology has been around for some time. Um, I've given you a snapshot of some of the, the publications um, dating back as, as far as 1968, which were using digital images in cytology and pathology um, to help interpret what was happening within those tissue samples to begin to measure some of those characteristics um, and to use this technology more effectively. The first publication that, uh, that I was involved with, as you can see, Histopathology in 1987, um, was using digital pathology to classify colorectal um, adenocarcinoma. Um, and I suppose the date of that publication not only tells you how old digital pathology is, but <laughs> how old I am and how long I've been involved in this, uh, in this space. But as with uh, many technologies, um, whilst there was enormous interest in the, in the 80s and 90s, um, digital pathology really died off in terms of the enthusiasm for the, for the technology. And this is probably typical of, of many uh, technology life cycles. Um, the initial enthusiasm or how it was going to replace pathologists and completely automate and remove the need for pathology was, um, was faced with the sudden realization that this just wasn't going to be the case and that um, and the pathologists were, were going to continue to be required to make those very difficult diagnostic decisions. The technology really wasn't right for implementation. And of course, at that stage, there was uh, the introduction of molecular diagnostics and molecular pathology, which really took over and uh, um, and, and overrun the interest in, in digital pathology. But since, uh, since the early 2000s, digital pathology is really beginning to grow again. Um, and I suppose that's primarily due to two things in my head anyway. One is the advent of whole slide imaging. So being able to take last slides and scan them in their entirety. And we've already heard from David about how that's now being implemented in, in routine primary diagnostics. But that's been a major change in, uh, in our attitude and our approach to, to, to digital pathology. And the other key area that I think is, is impacting this field is, the, it is again the recognition that pathologists have an absolutely central role to the delivery of personalized medicine or precision medicine. Um, identifying those biomarkers that allow us to, um, to stratify patients and identify which patients are going to benefit from, from a range of new therapies that are now becoming available to us. So these two areas are, are, are really seeing um, uh, and, and underpinning the regrowth that we see in, in digital pathology. 
And of course, uh, there are a range of uh, whole slide imaging systems that, that are available to us. Uh, we've already heard from David about the, the Omnic system, which is at, at the bottom. But you can see a lot of these, uh, these brand names are from companies that originally made conventional microscopes. And they're now all recognizing that, there, that there's a huge opportunity um, in taking glass slides and digitizing those for, uh, um, uh, for review on screen as opposed to down two tubes of a, of a microscope. These images are extremely large, um, as David has said, um, they can be up to 20 gigabytes per slide. Now you can compress those down, there may be issues around compression and about being able to interpret compressed images, but uh, we're really talking about significant requirements around storage and, and visualization of, of these images for routine purposes. There are probably, and again, David, you might be able to correct me, but there are probably only three players that are, uh, are in the, the primary diagnostic space at the moment. That's uh, Leica, um, who have acquired the Aperio platform. Um, we have uh, Omnix and we've got Philips. And uh, these three companies are really in a race at the moment to, to establish these pre-market approvals in the US to get FDA um, clearance for, for the use of these systems in, in clinical practice. But you can see that there are a range of systems that really take a glass slide in one end and produce a digital slide at the other. So, so that's clearly one, one area that, that has advanced and, uh, and is really underpinning the growth of digital pathology. The other, as I've said, is around precision medicine. So rather than taking a population of patients and treating them with a single drug with a whole mix of responses, those that, that benefit from the uh, drug, those that show no effect and some which may actually have adverse effects. Um, moving away from that model to trying to identify subpopulations of patients that have traditionally been characterized as having one disease, but in fact have multiple different types of disease. And by taking and identifying biomarkers that allow us to, to um, identify and stratify those patient groups. And many of these biomarkers can be found within tissue samples, uh, hence the, the really central role that pathologists have in the delivery uh, of precision medicine. A good example that people often use is, is breast cancer, which was originally considered to be a single disease, but I think at last count, it's probably about 16 different diseases. And obviously the ability to be able to identify and distinguish those patient groups and be able to treat them in a very personalized and precise way is clearly of benefit in terms of clinical outcomes. But there's a real challenge that the industry faces in, in the delivery of precision medicine and that's really the co-development of the therapeutic agent and the associated companion diagnostic or biomarker. Traditionally, these two pipelines would have been very independent and very separate with drug de development at the, at the top and, and biomarker development at, at, at the bottom. But, um, but these two industries now have to really come together. And that's why we're seeing an increased number of collaborations and acquisitions by big pharma of diagnostic companies. FDA, I think in 2011, said that any new drug being brought to market has to have a companion diagnostic associated with it. So there's a real drive to bring these two, two industries and these two pipelines together. But it's interesting if we look at where pathology and, and digital pathology cuts across these different pipelines, it has a significant role to play in accelerating both the development of the drug and the identification um, and implementation of associated companion biomarkers. Right from biobanking on the left hand side through to the use of tissue microarrays for biomarker discovery, the use of image analysis to support biomarker discovery and identification of new um, uh, biomarkers, its use in toxicological pathology, so set, assessing the toxicological impact of, of, of new drugs um, in, in animals and through to the development then and translation of algorithms out into, in, in, into clinical practice. And so this is where digital pathology is really um, seeing uh, uh, massive applications and is now being widely used by pharma and by diagnostic companies to support their activities. So together with all of the other associated instrumentation in this hybrid laboratory that not only does research and discovery but also um, has a clinical workload, um, all the molecular pathology samples from the, from the two trusts within, uh, 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 within Northern Ireland are, uh, are processed through this laboratory. And you can see that together with the sample preparation, microscopy, uh, the h and &E, the automated IHC, 
um, next generation sequencing devices, we've also integrated digital pathology and image scanning. Every single sample coming through the molecular pathology laboratory is, is scanned. Every single sample that is being, that is being biobanked within that laboratory is also scanned. So we archive these images and make these available to researchers and, uh, and to pathologists who, who require um, to review these samples. Um, so we've really integrated it. We've got a number of systems we're about to buy. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, Zeiss platform as well, so we've got Hamamatsu, Perio Zeiss, we've got a range of, uh, of, of software and image analysis platforms together with PathXL, which is providing the, uh, the integration of the images and the, the online storage and, and management of, of, of the range of images that, uh, that we're providing. So this gives us the ability within our organization um, to give researchers and pathologists access to these slides digitally from wherever they are, whether that's within their own offices, in the trusts, whether they're sitting at a research bench, um, or whether they're needing to access the images uh, from home. And this is provided using a cloud-based architecture that PathXL have developed um, and established together with an image management system that allows uh, pathologists to access those images in a very secure and robust fashion. And this gives us the tools then to support archiving, biobanking, training using digital pathology. So we've already heard tumor board meetings and MDT meetings, um, remote slide review. We use it extensively for biomarker discovery and validation, multi-site collaboration, and increasingly for multi-center clinical trials not just within our own institution, but to support collaboration with, uh, with different organizations in different part of the, parts of the world. So rather than taking our glass slides and have, putting those in a jiffy bag and, 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 and sending them to somewhere in the world, we can provide researchers and collaborators with access to these images, regardless of where they are, any time, any place. And um, yeah, I suppose this is underpinned by the statement that the pathologist no longer needs to be in the same room as the glass slide. And we've kind of uh, presented this uh, integrative approach to, to molecular diagnostics and pathology in, in a number of uh, research publications which you can read. But clearly that uh, provides us with the ability to share images and for pathologists to review those images online. And that's extremely important research, but we do understand and we do recognize and, and pathologists are the first to recognize that visual interpretation of images can be somewhat subjective. I often show this, um, this image to our, our trainee pathologists um, uh, who are really interested to, to, to do this experiment with. Pathologists are very often asked to take, uh, to look at an image similar to that on the, the left hand side of the screen and to evaluate the intensity of the biomarker within those cells, to evaluate the intensity of the IHC expression within those cells. And whenever I show this image on the right hand side, I ask the pathologist to look at uh, squares A and B, and some of you may have seen this before, but I ask them to look at A and B and score that on a scale from zero to, uh, to five, where zero is black and five is white. And, uh, and of course, when you ask a, a group um, of pathologists or individuals within an audience, you get a whole range of different um, scores that they might give for those, uh, those two squares. The reality is both of those squares are exactly the same color. There's no magic tricks here, Hugh. It's, they're all the same, same color. And this indicates how poor the human eye is really at assessing um, the, uh, the intensity or the density of, uh, of stains within, within samples. And this is reflected by the poor reproducibility that we often see when, when pathologists review these, these types of materials. And so there's a real opportunity to develop new and alternative tools. This is just a slide to indicate that pathologists recognize this as a problem. So a range of publications that, uh, um, that emphasize the errors that we can see in pathological diagnosis. The kappa value, which is a uh, statistical measure of um, of repeatability or reproducibility between, uh, between pathologists. Um, you can see that ranges from zero, which has absolutely no agreement, to one, which is full agreement, and you can see the range of results, some of which in any other industries would be considered to be um, appalling. Um, but that's what we find in some areas of diagnostic pathology. And of course, the, uh, the media takes great joy in, in, in highlighting this whenever errors are made in pathology and, and, and that results in, in poor patient um, 
uh, tests. So there's real opportunity to develop new and alternative methodologies that can support pathologists. It's not about replacing pathologists. It's about supporting pathologists in making more objective, reliable and reproducible decisions. And we can develop a range of algorithms that allow us to take that pixel um, related information that we have now in digital slides and to convert that into numbers, numerical data that can help make more objective and, uh, and reproducible classification of disease from nuclear markers right through to cytoplasmic staining and membrane staining and quantifying those much more precisely. And again, yeah, we've, uh, we've published extensively on the, on the role that digital pathology and image analysis can have in tissue biomarker research. Let me give you an example of why this can be really important. So this was a study that we did an, a number of years ago looking at uh, two um, potential candidate biomarkers in lung cancer. So these are um, proteins, pro-apitotic proteins called BAX and BAC. Um, and they're expressed in the way that you can see in this, uh, this central image of a, of a tissue microarray core. And we wanted to determine what the relationship was between the expression of these markers and clinical outcome as measured by, by patient survival. And so we took uh, quite a significant number of, of samples across four TMAs, specifically looking at, uh, at back immunohistochemistry, and we asked two pathologists, two experienced lung, sorry, this is in non-small cell lung carcinoma, and we asked two experienced pathologists to score these. And when we looked at the relationship with clinical outcome, we, we couldn't see any association between this marker and clinical outcome. But at that time, we had developed some tools that, uh, that allowed us to measure immunohistochemical expression more precisely using digital pathology and, and, and algorithms. And when we measured that much more precisely, we were able to show that, in fact, um, uh, Bax immunohistochemistry did have an association with clinical outcome. This was something that was being completely missed when we interpreted this visually. And so this, re this indicates that by using imaging and using quantitative evaluation of the image is much more sensitive to picking up uh, changes in immunodensity, um, which in turn can help us identify new biomarkers of, of, of outcome and response to therapy. This is just very new data, um, just generated over the last couple of weeks, um, where we had um, uh, looked at a, a, a biomarkers in breast cancer, uh, and this is the manual score by pathologists on the left-hand side where we did see a, a strong correlation with clinical outcome. Uh, this was done over 300 patient samples. Um, took the pathologists a long time to generate this data, so this was visually scoring each one of those individual cores. What you see on the right-hand side is a completely automated approach that we've used to doing this. This can be done in less than 10 minutes on the same set of samples. And you can see that in terms of its ability um, uh, to, uh, to distinguish between good and poor outcomes in patients, it gives very, very similar results. And in fact, in some cases, gives much better results. So this illustrates the real advantage and benefit of using quantitative imaging in, in biomarker discovery and, and identification. And it really allows you to do some, some difficult things. I call this augmented visualization in pathology. I don't see this as being something that completely removes the need for pathologists at all. But it allows pathologists to measure what's seeable, but it also allows them to detect things that, that are very difficult to see and use those to augment their decision-making process. Another example was um, uh, a study where we were looking at uh, um, a protein called FLIP and uh, another one called Procaspias 8, again in non-small cell lung carcinoma. Um, and here it was really, really difficult to distinguish where the expression was, um, uh, was located within the tissue samples. There was expression in the cytoplasm, there was also expression in the nucleus, and being able to distinguish those two compartments and the different levels of expression visually, very, very challenging. But we developed a number of algorithms um, that allowed us to identify the expression both in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, not just in the tumor, but also in the stroma, stroma and to evaluate this uh, in a series of adenocarcinoma and squamous carcinomas. And we were able to use quantitative criteria to define the thresholds between high and low scoring in both of these markers um, and identify not just those that showed um, high scoring for both of the markers, but also those that were much more heterogeneous in, in terms of um, uh, showing high for one and, and low for the other. 
And whilst looking at these individually added significant value and were, were, were of, of prognostic uh, value, it was really only by, by combining these different phenotypes, quantitative phenotypes, that we saw a very strong correlation with, uh, with clinical outcome. And so you can see how using imaging can, can really support um, the process of discovery um, and evaluation and translation of, of new markers. It also allows us to measure tissue heterogeneity, the variation of these biomarker expressions within tissue. This again is something very difficult to do visually, assessing across even small regions of tissue, determining the, the level of variation in, in expression. But because we've got that data in a, in a digital format, because we can quantitatively evaluate that, then we can identify cases that, um, that have a very low level of variation against cases which have a very broad spectrum of variation. And in fact, it may well be the variation in the biomarker expression that is of true value rather than the median uh, of, that, uh, of that marker. And so image analysis is now beginning to find real value in, 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 in that area. One area that, um, uh, that you will have heard a lot about is, um, uh, is immuno-oncology and, and immunotherapy. Um, there are a range of new markers that, uh, that are available that potentially allow us to determine um, uh, pot uh, new drugs that, uh, that can modulate the, the host immune response in patients. This completely relies on pathological review because it's not just about the expression of these markers but it's exactly where these cells sit and are located within the context of tissue samples, whether these cells are inside the tumour, whether they're at the, the tumour periphery or whether they're in the stroma. And so it's really important to be able to quantitatively evaluate and count the numbers of cells in each of those different compartments. And we've been developing a range of tools that allow us to do this. We've uh, developed our, our own platform called QPath within the university. Um, these two individuals have just recently joined the, the group and have been doing a superb job in building tools that can allow us to rapidly evaluate tissue microarrays that can identify tumour within those tissue microarrays, can count the numbers of inflammatory cells labelled in different ways within those, uh, within those samples, both with, within the tumour and outside of the tumour, and characterise these in ways that we just haven't been able to do before. And this is going to lead to new potential quantitative markers that, um, uh, that can help us predict outcome uh, and determine the appropriate course of, of therapy for, uh, for patients. And we're really challenged uh, within research environments like our own because we've got huge numbers of potential data sets that we can evaluate these markers on. And whilst we've developed imaging tools, um, the ability to run these across very large uh, populations of samples remains a challenge. And so to try and support this area, we've developed um, high performance imaging systems. So this is a, uh, a, an HP Blade system that we developed. Um, that um, rather than analyzing each one of those individual tissue microarray cores in a sequential fashion, we can form these out in a very parallelized fashion and generate data very rapidly. And this is becoming increasingly important because mo many of the studies that, uh, that we're doing now, they're not on 100 samples, they're not on 300 samples. We're just about to start a program that's probably going to look at 30,000 breast cancers across Europe. And obviously being able to evaluate a, a panel of multiple markers across that number of patient samples visually using conventional pathology resources is just not going to be possible. So imaging is going to support us in being able to identify which of those markers has clinical utility on those sort of, uh, that sort of scale of study. And this is just a complex slide showing the kind of speed up that we can get on, on tissue microarrays specifically. But yeah, we can, we can speed this up by at least 100 times um, doing it using, using high performance computing. And this work is being, being supported by a number of programs, but this represents the real, uh, the real interest that there is, with, particularly within the UK, but I think globally, in developing these technologies. So this is a, a, a new program grant that, uh, that Belfast has just been successful in, it's a CRUK. Um, for those of you not aware, uh, Cancer Research UK is probably the largest um, cancer charity funding cancer research in, in Europe and it's funded a new uh, uh, accelerator award in Belfast. It's very much focused on digital pathology 
um, and the development of algorithms to support immune oncology and standardizing those across six UK centers. Um, so this is a major program that Belfast is, is leading. So automated imaging in, in tissue research is, is really going to drive discovery uh, of next generation of, of tissue biomarkers for, for precision medicine. But won't tissue pathology be redundant in the next few years? Clearly we've heard today already about you know, advances in molecular technology, about being able to take DNA from tissue samples, being able to sequence that and, and identify genomic anomalies that, um, that will support, uh, support diagnosis. Um, and of course that is a really important area of development. It's really transforming how we practice pathology. So in pathology, we not only look at, uh, at tissue samples and immunohistochemical markers, but there's an increasing number of tests where we can take those tissue samples, extract the nucleic acids from those and identify um, uh, mutations in, in genes such as KRAS, EGFR, BRAF, et cetera, which are really important in, in, in stratifying patients. And if we think about, and of course, um, uh, we, we're seeing a rapid development in, in clinical sequencing and the development of gene panels again, which is purely um, reliant on, uh, on extracting DNA from, from tissue samples. But if we look at the, um, uh, the, the pipeline that these new technologies and new techniques rely on, we can see at the bottom here, this, these are all of the, the, the new molecular assays that are now available, a whole range of them, plus uh, different platforms such as Sanger QPS, uh, uh, QPCR, next generation sequencing, all of which are, are reliant on DNA extraction. But at the top of this uh, workflow, um, samples that are entered into these, uh, these molecular tests um, rely on the pathologist reviewing the H&E slide. So it still relies on the pathologist reviewing that slide, marking up the area of tumor, determining the percentage of tumor within that sample to ensure that there is sufficient tumor DNA to make the molecular test at the bottom of the pipeline relevant and, and accurate. And we've already heard today about, uh, about some of the issues that have been faced by large molecular programs uh, and uh, sequencing programs where, they, where the samples just haven't had the level of quality necessary in order to produce uh, reliable results. Um, the uh, 100,000 Genome Project in, in the UK um, uh, carried out a number of initial trials and taking samples from a range of different laboratories across the UK. 60% of the samples were failing due to, insu due to insufficient tumor. Um, and, and so we can see that evaluating the tissue sample ahead of molecular diagnostics is extremely important. Back to pathologists, back to the review of those tissue samples. And that's why we've, uh, we've worked very closely uh, pa uh, between PathXL and the university to develop a product called TissueMark to support pathologists in the, uh, the routine evaluation of tissue samples for molecular diagnostics. So really bridging the gap between molecular diagnostics uh, and conventional morphology using digital pathology as, as the interface. And so really what this allows us to do is move from, uh, from what you can see on the left hand side, which is um, how pathologists currently do this. Um, taking a glass slide and manually marking it with a black marker, estimating the percentage of tumor cells on that, to the right hand side where we can do this automatically using digital pathology and, and imaging. And we can do this on a variety of different tissue types. We use PathXL's tissue recognition engine, which is a range of algorithms and processes and routines that allow us to identify different patterns within tissue and detect underlying tumor patterns so that we can characterize those and annotate those um, and measure those characteristics automatically within H&E tissue samples. And this allows us to, um, uh, to take a tissue sample and um, uh, process it very quickly, so this can be done in, in probably uh, in under three minutes within, a, within an H&E &E, uh, tissue sample, where it can then identify the individual tumor islands and tumor components within that, draw a heat map of that, annotate that boundary, and use that then as the reference for molecular diagnostics. And here we can see this for lung cancer at the top, breast cancer in the middle, and, uh, and colon cancer at the bottom. What about the percentage of tumor cells? This is a really key issue. It's, it's one of the 
again an example of uh, uh, of a uh, an, ev an evaluation or a measurement that pathologists find particularly challenging and particularly difficult to do uh, reproducibly and reliably. Um, but yet it's so important for a whole range of molecular diagnostic tests. Depending on the sensitivity of that test, then the percentage of tumor cells is really important to assess. If you don't have enough tumor cells in there, your molecular test, molecular test just will not work. Um, and so, um, just to give an example of, of, uh, of some of the challenges that pathologists face, what we, what we did was we took 20 high resolution images of non-small cell lung carcinoma, um, circulated those to four pathologists and, and asked those pathologists to estimate the, the percentage of tumor. And here you can see some of the results. Um, if you take the case on the left hand side, you can see that's one case, you can see the four pathologists um, uh, uh, associated with, th with that bar and you can see that the percentage of tumor ranged anywhere from 20% through to 80% and this can make the difference um, uh, as to whether a patient is treated with a drug or not treated with a drug. And we're seeing an increasing number of publications coming out recognizing that this inability to assess tumor percentage correctly um, can result in false negative molecular testing. And so we developed a range of algorithms that allowed us to quantitative, quantitatively evaluate and count the number of nuclei within individual tissue samples. Um, and uh, when we compare this against actual tumor cell counts, so we actually took a series of cases and had pathologists manually count every single damn nucleus within, within those samples to give us that benchmark that we needed. Um, so after many, many hours of activity and, and several trips to rehab, we, um, we had the data that we needed to really evaluate whether the imaging worked or not. And this is really important in studies of this type is to get those accurate benchmarks. And we can see that we get a very strong correlation with our actual precise benchmark results. If we look at how pathologists performed relative to that, you can see the huge variation that we, that we get. And, uh, and we haven't left it to pathologists to try and take this technology and adopt it themselves. We've built this within a very cool, very neat workflow that can be easily implemented within molecular diagnostic pathology labs. Where the slides are scanned, um, they, they're analyzed by the algorithm, the uh, algorithm will annotate the samples, it'll pro provide measures of the percentage of tumor cells. This can then be taken by the lab tech and the lab tech can use this for macro dissection and the selection of samples. So really it's about defining a tissue quality index for molecular diagnostics based on H&E image analysis. And we've published this uh, recently in, in Oncotarget. And what's interesting about this paper is that this is a real mix of skills and individuals that have contributed to this. This is an industry paper, so Path Excel were developed, were developed the technology. We've got pathologists from NHS hospitals, health providers here. We've got scientists on board and bioinformaticians on board. So it's a real mix of, uh, uh, of industry, health service and academia that are developing these types of technologies and that's an important point to make. But what about um, automated imaging and, and decision support for primary diagnostics? And I'll, I'll really finish um, on this. Well, we have a number of, uh, of algorithms that have been cleared by the FDA, 510K cleared, um, primarily related to breast cancer, admittedly, ER, PR, HER2, Key67. Um, and these have been approved for, uh, for use. A um, good example of this is, is HER2, where pathologists have to score this subjectively on a, uh, on a scale from 0 to, to 3. Um, but we know from studies that, um, that this is very subjective because it's a, it's a spectrum of change and the pathologist has to position those, those cases, those real patients, on the this, uh, this spectrum. And 20% of cases are considered to be misclassified using visual criteria. And so imaging and image analysis can provide op objective and much more reliable data uh, in the interpretation of a marker such as HER2. FDA, as I've said, have given 510K clearance for the use of algorithms for, uh, for HER2 measurement in, in routine practice. ASCO-CAP have, have recommended this as a methodology provided it's validated within, within a, a, a diagnostic lab. 
and health insurers in the US have, uh, um, have reimbursement codes now for HER2 uh, image analysis tests. So this is a real step forward in terms of using this type of technology for routine diagnostic decision making but it hasn't been adopted the way that we thought it would have been adopted. And I think this is one of the key challenges. And I think this adoption of imaging technologies like this rely completely um, on the adoption of digital pathology for primary review and diagnosis, the types of studies that David was describing earlier on, and the, uh, um, uh, and the adoption of, uh, uh, of digital slide scanning platforms for, for primary diagnostics. Once pathologists begin to use those for primary review, doing what they've always done down in microscope, but, uh, uh, but on screen, we can then begin to layer on these additional tools for imaging and image analysis and decision support that will really um, uh, facilitate and improve their ability to make diagnostic decisions. This is really just a table showing, uh, showing where FDA is on, on digital pathology. Um, as you've already heard, that very top line, which is around primary diagnosis at the moment, um, FDA have, um, have classed uh, scanners as class three devices, so, um, uh, so it's not approved for primary diagnosis yet. That's likely to change within the next 18 to 24 months. As I said, a number of these companies are undergoing PMAs at the moment and, and it's likely that that will be approved. And that will open the floodgates. Clearly there are issues over, uh, over cost and, uh, uh, and health economics, but it's likely, we're likely to see a massive um, introduction of digital pathology for primary review. Um, but it can currently be used at the moment for, uh, for second opinion consultations, um, on whole slide images, for frozen section, and as I've already said, uh, for a uh, for select number of uh, IHC biomarkers. Manuel, who's uh, just joined us, welcome Manuel, um, uh, uh, classified these into, into two types really. Um, the upper section is about applications that, that make your life easier um, and the ones at the bottom are applications that make the quality of your work better. So the use of image analysis technologies can clearly improve the reliability of diagnostic decision making. Some of the barriers to, um, uh, to the entry of these, these systems into primary diagnosis uh, are addressed here and David has already um, cut through these all, um, this morning or this afternoon. So the key question is, is the digital pathology safe? and is digital pathology cost effective? We've done a number of studies looking at safety uh, in digital pathology, um, uh, a, a study looking at uh, a general uh, surgical pathology cases across a range of difficulties as defined by the Royal College of Pathologists, and another study then focusing very much on, uh, on gastrointestinal um, pathology. And in both of these studies, very similar to those that have been presented earlier, um, uh, there was this very strong concordance between the diagnostic decision that was made on glass and the decision that was made um, uh, digitally. Um, there were a small number of discrepancies, but those were of no clinical significance. And in some cases, the, uh, the decision that was made on, on digital was the preferred one. So these studies are adding to the, uh, uh, the evidence that digital pathology can be used safely in, in routine diagnosis. There's a great study that has come out of the University of Pittsburgh, again associated with the Omnix platform, that has really looked at the, the cost effectiveness of, of digital pathology, very much in the US setting. And so David, I'm looking forward to seeing your results in, in the UK setting uh, as to the, the level of, uh, of cost effectiveness in introducing digital pathology uh, for, for primary diagnostics. So we're moving very rapidly towards the, uh, uh, towards the, the use of digital pathology for primary diagnostics, and that's going to drive our ability to be able to develop new algorithms and new methodologies. This is often shown at digital pathology conferences, the, the vision of a digital pathology cockpit, and I think we're, we're very close to this, where pathologists will be the perfect integrators of all of this information where they can access the clinical, clinical information, they can access the digital images, but where they'll also have tools to support their decision making using uh, image, image analysis. So where has all the investment gone in terms of image analysis and the use of algorithms? Um, well, you've seen, uh, you've seen some of the, the data that I presented that a lot of the uh, emphasis has been on IHC imaging. Um, and clearly digital pathology and image analysis has a, has a strong role to play there, but that's only about 5% of what pathologists uh, um, do. 
Um, the vast majority of what pathologists review are H and E samples, and I think there's a real need to begin to develop algorithms to support pathologists making decisions on, on H and E. And this is an area where we spent a lot of time, a lot of effort working, and PathExcel is very much focusing on, on this area. Where again, in prostate biopsies, you can identify the regions of tumor, you can estimate tumor bulk, you can calculate the number of cores that are occupied by tumor, you can begin to use imaging to support the Gleason grading of, of tissue samples by looking at the distribution of points within samples automatically, measuring and quantifying those, and providing objective data to support the grading of, uh, of different types of cancer. Glandular identification, the ability to be able to identify um, nuclear crowding within samples, nuclear stratification and levels of dysplasia. This is a study on the right hand side where we looked at individual H&E nuclei looking at the chromatin organization, the distribution of chromatin within tissue samples and we were able to define very specific nuclear signatures that allowed us to plot progression in prostate cancer. These are the types of tools that I think are going to really change how pathology is practiced only when pathology and digital pathology is adopted for routine uh, diagnostic decision making. It's only then that we'll be able to layer on top some of these uh, additional tools. What I want to finish with is today is the first day that um, driverless cars are being tested in Australia. Huge amount of investment gone into developing the technology around driverless cars. Um, and I think if we invested the same level of, uh, of funding into digital pathology, into the development of algorithms, we'd see a massive change in improvements, a reduction of, of, of errors in pathology and improvements in clinical outcome. Let me just run this uh, video while I'm talking, if I can. Let me see if we can do this. Are we going to run here? It's running earlier. Yeah, I'm trying to. Maybe I, oh, I need to do it on the screen, right? Okay, here we go. There we are. And hopefully the sign is down. So yeah, five years ago it was. Uh, this should be running here. It's not. Yeah, okay. It is. Here we go. Yeah. So five years ago it was a very simple problem of cars driving straight, knowing which was uh, where the vehicles were on the left and right hand side, and being aware of those and identifying those those types of vehicles and being able to assess distance between those. But once cars started going into pedestrian precincts, with all of the complexity of information that that exists there in terms of pedestrians, lights, other traffic, you can see the real complexity of the problem that driverless cars faced. And, and these types of issues are the same types of issues that we face in digital pathology and in, in developing imaging tools, where we're looking at very complex images, very complex environments, but developing the right algorithms and the right tools um, to support decision making and the identification of those anomalies that underpin um, the patterns that are associated with cancer um, and, and other diseases. It's really interesting, some of the algorithms that, that are available to identify what is a policeman saying stop and distinguishing that from pedestrians and, and other activities that are seen within, uh, within driverless cars. And so this is really just an example showing how investment in technology, investment in algorithms and the complexity associated with that can really drive forward a technology. And this is really the direction that we need to go in in digital pathology to support next generation diagnostics. And this gives us the ability to map samples, to map tissue samples in complex and new ways, and to integrate the phenotypic information where there's a huge amount of rich data and information together with genotypes um, to capture tumor heterogeneity. So we've come a long way, finishing off, we've come a long way um, in, in developing these technologies. They've been around for a long time, but it may be an overused cliche, but we really are at a tipping point in terms of the technology and the capabilities and the associated um, uh, uh, solutions that are currently available. And I think we're going to all be involved in developing the new solutions moving into next generation diagnostics. Thanks very much indeed.